ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Ezra, chapter 9. Ezra, chapter 9. <clears throat> Ezra chapter 9, and um, we've been absent uh, from our meeting for a couple of weeks, but <clears throat> the Jews have gone back to the promised land after the 70 years of captivity in Babylon, and they've gained favor from uh, the king of Persia, who is the reigning monarch now. And uh, so Ezra, and along with Nehemiah, which we'll get to when we get to that book, have been given great uh, uh, liberty to ask what they need to rebuild the city, rebuild the temple, and to furnish the, the temple with all the things necessary for the priests. And I think the last time we met, we considered that some of these uh, people that made their trip back to Israel, Jerusalem, among all those people, they couldn't find any Levites um, qualified to be priests, and so they had to go and round some up and bring them and uh, uh, prompt them to come back to Jerusalem, which was their birthright, their heritage. So let's read the first four verses here in Ezra chapter 9. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, <clears throat> doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves, and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel, because of the transgression of those that had been carried away, and I sat a stonied until the evening sacrifice. This section of the Bible brings up one of the most uh, overlooked and misunderstood subjects, and the subject that has literally driven people out of their minds because they can't accept certain truths in life. And it's the subject of segregation. Uh, run back real quickly to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. And simply notice one verse there, verse 8. Well, we'll read verses 7 and 8. Deuteronomy 32, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. You know, one day the Jew is going to rule the entire world under the leadership of Christ, their Messiah. And the land grant given to Abraham and his descendants is much larger than that land of Israel today. In fact, it goes from the Mediterranean all the way over to uh, roughly the city of Babylon. That entire area where Iraq is now, that's all part of the land God promised to Abraham and his seed. But during the reign of Christ, of course, the Jew will be elevated to the prominence once again, to prominence once again, and all the other nations subordinate to the Jew under the reign of Christ the Messiah. But ever since Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, 
Man's attempt at forcing harmony among people has always ended in disaster. Uh, because God divided them. I get to talking about these things and you say, oh, be careful what you say. That's part of the problem of the world we live in. You can't be frank and blunt and point out certain obvious things in the world. Uh, men are not women. Women are not men. Um, white, the white race is not like the Asian race. The Asian race is not like the black race. And uh, God divided the three sons of Noah Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and they went off and became the fathers of those three distinctions. Japheth, the father of the Anglo-European peoples, Ham, the father of the African or dark-skinned peoples, and Shem, the father of the Eastern, uh, what we, they call in Arabic now, Middle Eastern peoples, the Semitic peoples. And God, God took that that lineage of Shem, Shem's descendants, and he took one man out of that lineage, Abraham, and said, I'm going to create a new people from you. So from that time on, Abraham's descendants were known as the Jew. Everybody else, even fellow Shemites, were all regarded as Gentiles. But the original Gentile was the, was the uh, Japhethites, the Descend, the white descendants of Japheth. Uh, it says in Genesis uh, 10, God divided uh, their lands. He says, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, meaning the descendants of Japheth, the Caucasian. But uh, now everyone who's not a Jew and a descendant from Abraham or of the faith of Abraham is considered a Gentile. Um, the United Nations has not prevented Wars. In fact, more wars have begun and been fought among uh, UN member nations since the founding of the UN. They have done nothing to stave off or stop countries within their ranks from going to war with each other. The lost secular world seems to live in a fantasy that everybody's the same, everybody thinks the same, everybody acts the same, everybody is going to respond the same. And uh, they're not. Now, I debated whether to even touch on this, but for generations, the uh, Dutch uh, government, the Dutch people who organized the country of South Africa, had in place a system called apartheid, separating the races, and only the uh, Dutch and those who they designated um, worthy, were allowed to vote in their elections and hold political office and so forth. And of course this was seen as a great evil in the world. And uh, it had to be stopped. And Nelson Mandela was uh, really a communist sympathizer and uh, would not, they put him in prison. He was there for 25 years and uh, anytime he would swear off violence against the government they would have released him, but he never would do so. And his wife, uh, former wife, years ago, Winnie Mandela, she was famous for necklacing people, that is, putting rubber car tires around the person, then setting the tire ablaze with the person trapped inside of it. And a real fine woman, I'd love to be married to her, wouldn't you? But, uh, but, but, so once the government dismantled that, um, Nelson Mandela was released from prison <clears throat> and was elected the first black president of South Africa. And I think they've had nothing but black presidents uh, since then. But there was reason why the Dutch had a policy like that in place. If you look back, I can go on the internet and look for world maps, old, old world maps. By the mid-1400s, the Spaniards and the Portuguese, and even some German explorers, had mapped out almost every continent of the world. And uh, think of an engineering feat of making seaworthy vessels that could set out on the open seas 
and be there and be gone for weeks and months before finding their way back home and drawing maps of every continent as they went. And this was in the middle of the 1400s. Uh, those European explorers had uh, charted almost the entire world. I don't think they had reached uh, North America quite yet. At least I, don't, I couldn't find any old maps depicting it yet. But all of Europe and the African continent and the Far East and China and so forth. In the early 1600s, the British happened upon the southern tip of Africa for a short time, but never made a permanent colony there. And about 30, 40 years later, the Dutch from Holland were sailing around the western coast of Africa, trying to find quick, quicker trade routes to India. You could carry a lot more cargo uh, by, by ship and bring back a lot more cargo by ship than you could simply buy caravans across the desert, across the, the Middle East by land, the camel trains and so forth. So they're trying to find quicker trade routes to India and the Far East. And they get to the southern tip of Africa. And that becomes a, a station. Cape Town eventually was formed there. And the country of South Africa grew out of that. That's why there's so much Dutch dominance in the country of South Africa because that's where the, uh, the Dutch settled and made up sort of a halfway point from Europe out of the Mediterranean all the way around Africa to the Far East. But empires had risen and fallen in uh, Europe. And as I said, the engineering feat to build seaworthy ships that could go out for months and months uh, without sinking at sea and find their way back home. And they were drawing new maps as they went, updating old maps as they uh, navigated the coastline. And when they got to the southern tip of Africa, the Kalahari Bushmen and people in the living out there, they encountered a race of people, and it sounds cruel to say, but had not yet invented the wheel. And their natural reaction was these people are centuries behind our development. I know that's not politically correct to talk that way, but facts are facts. People can have their own opinions, but they can't have their own facts. And um, that's nevertheless part of the African history or South African history and um, European history, the history of uh, European trade and colonialism. But that was nevertheless true. If you, if you type in, go to the Google search engine, and up in the right hand corner you can click uh, images, Google images. Click that and then on the search line type tribal Africans 2018 and see what kind of pictures and images come up. You'll find people still living with no clothing, unable to read and write, barely able to farm beyond a, beyond a mere subsistence level. And then along with that you'll find pictures from that Marvel Comics movie, The Black Panther, about this fictional kingdom in Africa where they're, they're so sophisticated and developed with high-tech space-age technology, but they've kept it secret because all the mountains are cloaked under an invisible shield, and they've kept all these uh, secret technologies to themselves. Of course, that's all fantasy. That's all fiction. That's make-believe. The other images are true to life in many parts of Africa today. It's, I, know, I know we're not supposed to say things like that, but the truth is the Dutch thought these people are not developed sufficiently to participate in our government, to vote in our elections, to make uh, consequential decisions that are going to affect the finances, the economics, the education of our country. And uh, we need, they sort of took a wait and see approach that went on for a long time. 
until they were forced by world pressure and media pressure to dismantle that uh, apartheid form of government. And even simply describing those things, as I have just now, uh, makes me a little bit uneasy because I don't know what people think when they're watching our videos, and not that many watch our Wednesday night Bible lesson, but some may. And uh, it doesn't give me any thrill as a white American to say those things, but it's historically true. And uh, I say all those things to say that the nations are not all the same. Peoples, uh, people around the world are not all the same. And uh, the races of men are not all the same. Um, that's an undeniable truth of life. Racial segregation converts into spiritual segregation, or separation, if you prefer that word, in the New Testament. And there are no longer any hard and fast rules and commandments in the New Testament against racial uh, mixing, as there were in the Old Testament, particularly or specifically for the Jews to keep their identity separate. Do you realize in the end of the book of Numbers, you'll read how that the 12 tribes were not even to intermingle between tribes. They were to keep the tribes uh, distinct from each other, never mind marrying outside the nation of Israel. <coughs> now, there are a few verses, I would say, in the New Testament that sort of point the way against mixing of the races. But like I said, there are no hard and fast commandments given in the New Testament because no matter um, who they, another person is, of any country, any language, any race, any ethnicity, any skin color, if they are born again and are trusting in the saving grace of Jesus Christ alone, they are my brother or my sister in Jesus Christ. Every Christian should look at it that way. But there are some verses that would seem to sort of point you away from mixing races as a practical, uh, for practical reasons. Think of um, think of uh, Timothy, Acts chapter 16. Paul's describing, or we read about Timothy, uh, whose parents, his father was an unbelieving Greek, his mother uh, a believing Jew. So not only were there two races mixed together, one was a believer, the other was not a believer. And um, he wanted to do something for God, and Paul thought, I can use him. But for testimony's sake, he didn't have to get circumcised, but for testimony's sake among the Jews that Paul was going to, uh, he had Timothy to be circumcised so that um, he wouldn't be a stumbling block or an offense to the Jews, um, many of whom still insisted on circumcision for everybody, Jew or Gentile, if they turned to Jesus Christ. There was that element. But uh, there was a young woman who asked me, uh, we've been married 34 years, 10 years ago, uh, a young woman asked me, I told her that that day was, happened to be my wedding anniversary, and she said, well, what advice would you give to someone like me who wants to get married someday and I don't want to fail? And I said, well, you're the, f you're the first person who's ever asked me for that kind of advice. And maybe I'm not the right one, but I would suggest find somebody who is as much like you as possible. Find someone who is the same age bracket, someone of uh, the same political views. A Democrat has no business marrying a Republican, and vice versa. Uh, somebody who is of the same religious uh, faith and belief as you are, and someone who is of the same race as you are. And don't be discouraged by people who say you're some sort of a narrow-minded bigot for doing so. Don't buy into that. You want to eliminate as many hurdles as possible so you don't have to leap over them later after you get married. That just seems to be a, a matter of common sense. But common sense isn't very common anymore in the world. Very few people have it. Um, and, um, but the Jews in the Old Testament were commanded to segregate all kinds of things. They were to segregate 
their, the material they use for their clothing and their crops, Leviticus 19. They were to separate, or separate uh, their form of dress in, I think, Leviticus 22 or Deuteronomy 22. And uh, they were to segregate or separate their food, Leviticus 18, dividing between clean meats and unclean meats and so forth. Even their haircuts are mentioned in Leviticus 19, how they would cut their hair. And besides uh, the issues of circumcision and worshiping uh, on the Sabbath day observance, uh, and racial segregation or separation was a part of it. Now verse 1 again, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. The people, there mentioned in verse 1, of those lands which were listed, uh, were all descended from Ham. Noah's youngest son, Genesis 9. And uh, they had integrated themselves with the holy seed, as they're called in verse 2, that's Israel. And Israel came from the descendants of Shem, Noah's middle son. And it was the Jewish leaders who had led the people into this uh, blunder, this error. They're called the princes and the rulers there at the end of verse 2. Now the word uh, astonied, verse 4, that's the root for our English word, astonished. And uh, it's not used very often these days. But it might even actually be a better word than astonished, because astoni means as still as a stone. Uh, there's a verse that gives us the definition for that. Back in Genesis 15. Genesis 15. And there are verse 16. Genesis 15, verse 16. I think that's it. No, that's not it. <coughs> and I wrote it down, but I must have written down the wrong. I'm sorry, Exodus 15. Exodus 15 and verse 16. <clears throat> Exodus 15, verse 16. Uh, Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone. That's the definition of a stony. And until thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. But, uh, uh, or think of the word petrified. That's a pretty uh, good word, petrified. Someone, he's uh, got so much fear, he can't move. He's frozen um, because of fear and dread. And uh, also notice the phrase in verse 4 of our text. It says, Everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. That's what gets the Lord's attention. Go forward to the book of Isaiah 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66, and the first two verses. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look even to him that is poor and of contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. That's what gets the Lord's attention. It's not someone who trembles only at the fundamentals that were listed for him by a particular denomination, or trembling at church creeds, 
or trembling at the elusive, long-lost, original manuscripts, which no one's ever found. Uh, today's Christians, almost everywhere in America, have been taught to believe that there is no book available to them that, which they can hold in their hands, which are the perfect living words of God uh, and the words uh, for which they're going to give account someday. One modern translation, well, you say tomato, I say tomato. You have a uh, NIV, I have a New American Standard Version. He's got a Revised Standard Version. He's got the New Living Translation. She's got the New World Translation. He's got the, the Living Bible. They've got this, that, or the other. And they all sort of think they're all the same. Go to some of these big um, mega churches that have bookstores and coffee shops on their premises. Some of the Calvary chapels like that do. You can go in their church bookstore and find, I've, I've gone some, I've found five, six, seven different translations of the Bible for sale in their Bible section. Well, they can't all be right. They can't, if they disagree with each other, which one's right, which one's wrong. Maybe they're both wrong, but they can't all be right. And um, all that proves, all that illustrates is that the pastor, who is ultimately responsible for that, doesn't believe there's any single book in the world that is the perfect word of God from cover to cover. And therefore, he said, well, have a few different translations people can choose from. They're all about the same. But not someone who simply trembles at the message or simply trembles at the principles found in the word of God. Nobody trembles at anything, hardly anymore. That's sad. But um, let's go to verses 5 through 15. We'll read the rest of the chapter. And at the evening, excuse me, and at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the land, of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace hath been shown, showed from the Lord, our God, to leave us a remnant to escape, and to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O Lord God, what shall we say after this, for we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets, saying, The land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their health or, excuse me, or their wealth forever that ye may be strong, and eat the good of the land, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us, for our evil deeds, and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and hast given us such deliverance as this, should we again break thy commandments, and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldst thou not be angry with us till thou hadst consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped, as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. This lengthy prayer ends with a uh, profound question there in verse 14. 
Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Um, go, if you will, to Luke chapter 16. Luke 16. Luke 16. And notice there verse 15. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. That's God's opinion. That's the opinion of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning all of this can we all just get along rhetoric in the world today. As I mentioned a little while ago, the UN has not prevented wars from taking place. Uh, they let their member nations go to war, and then they send in their cadre of uh, blue-helmeted UN peacekeepers who don't keep any peace at all. And um, was it Michael New, an American army officer, Michael, uh, a soldier, who uh, was going to be sent to patrol some area wearing a UN uniform the, under a UN commander, and he refused to do it. He swore to uphold the U.S. Constitution and uh, defend the United States as a U.S. Army officer, and they wanted to court-martial the guy, make a, drag him through the mud, and drag his name through the mud, because he wouldn't play uh, this globalist game with the United Nations. But the Jews cannot make peace with the Palestinians. And um, I heard today of a, a high-level Jewish general and a, advisor to Netanyahu who resigned because Israel's trying to make some sort of peace treaty with the Palestinians. And he said, this is like committing suicide. So he, he resigned. Of course, the Palestinians are excited. That gives them a boost, a shot in the arm. But he's absolutely right. And um, nor can uh, Christianity have any affinity with Islam, or with a true believers can have any affinity with Roman Catholicism, or with unbelieving Judaism, or with the cults, or with the queers, or with any other group that that uh, fights against the words of the living God. Amen. That sounds mean to say, it sounds harsh to say, and we're supposed to be, we're uh, told by the unbelieving world that uh, Christ preached love. You're not showing love. That's somebody who's never read the Bible. That's somebody who doesn't know how to rightly divide the word of truth if his soul depended upon it. And one day maybe his soul will depend upon it. He'll stand before the Lord Jesus at the great white throne and be shown all of his mistakes and his misinterpretations of Scripture, forcing this sort of secular idea that everybody is the same, everybody acts the same, everybody should get along the same. Um, in a country like the United States, where we've given religious liberty as, as part of our national identity. You know that when the First Amendment to, to the Constitution guaranteed the freedom of religion, all of the founders had in mind at that time multiple Christian denominations, multiple Protestant denominations. In the earliest days, of the United States, Catholicism was against the law. The Puritans had laws against celebrating Christmas here in the New World. They said that was a, a Roman Catholic paganism, and Christians have no business engaging in it. And uh, I'm certain they had only um, a plural or a plethora of Protestant denominations in mind when they said religious liberty among people. They had no intention of letting uh, Muslims in, who didn't contribute to building this country. Even uh, former, I think he passed away now, but former New York Mayor uh, Ed Koch years ago, liberal Democrat, but a, a Jew, he said, I may regret that, um, the constant, that, that America wasn't founded by Jews, and that Jews played a very minor part in the earliest days of America, but to pretend otherwise that's not uh, history, that's psychiatry. And uh, I said, good for him. At least he was honest. 
and not everybody contributed in building the United States as the rest of the world came to know it and love it and want a piece of it. The illegal aliens aren't building America. They're, I mean, I saw the picture on the internet of them climbing over the border fence that's sort of old and dilapidated now uh, from Mexico. And um, so, but, but not only was the, see, not only was Ezra's concern about Israel mixing with the other races, the nations, but when one person's religious views enter into somebody else's religious view, they corrupt his religious views, his convictions, then the word of God, if it was ever part of it, gets watered down, it gets set aside, and we put off what God's book says in order to be nice with someone else and pretend to get along, pretend like we love one another. Um, women want to do what men do, and men are not allowed to be men, act like men any longer. I, uh, I just found out yesterday, heard yesterday, some of you might have seen it on the news within the last week, but I only heard about it yesterday, about a, uh, um, a black uh, public high school teacher in Maywood. He's a music teacher, and they, they wear uniforms at that school, and he had a 14, 15-year-old uh, young Hispanic kid who was not in school uniform. The teacher told him to leave because he wasn't dressed right for school. And instead of taking orders and respecting authority, the teacher is 64 years old. He's right, approaching retirement age. But um, rather than mind the teacher, the kid went off on a whole string of racial tirades using all the wrong words against this black teacher. And of course, all the kids have cell phones. They're recording everything going on in their classroom. And uh, you, you should see the calm of this teacher standing there letting this kid mouth off, taking it, taking it, taking it, uh, waiting for the kid to finally be done. And when the kid wouldn't, re, uh, wouldn't relent, the teacher, boom! He just smacked off and smacked that kid uh, with his fist right in the head. Of course, the kid wants to take on the teacher, and that teacher got the best of that kid. I mean, he, he pummeled that kid. And, uh, of course, the security guard had to finally come in, the teachers break him apart. But I thought, that's my kind of teacher. You know, you take that and take that and take that. And the kid had it coming. The kid deserved it. The kid was asking for it. The kid got what, from the teacher what his parents should have given him some time ago. In fact, we're going to find them and pummel them for being delinquent parents. It's just sad that these people raise animals and then turn them loose on the rest of society to prey upon you and me. I mean, there's a high probability the kid's not born out of wedlock, statistics being what they are, and um, the high dropout rate among students in his uh, ethnic background is um, something the L.A. Unified School District that the L.A. County has been dealing with for years, one of the highest dropout rates in the country. Nearly 50% of Hispanic and higher than that of black students drop out of high school. They never finish. And rather than respect the authority, uh, he got what was coming to him. And I thought, and, and so the news channels, they pick up the video where the teacher hits the student and they, they leave off the stuff beforehand. Yeah. They say, and, and their explanation was, well, his language is so uh, vile, we can't show it on the air. But you can show the, the fight ensuing in the classroom. You see, the news media is the enemy. Like President Trump says, they are the enemy of the people because they always take the wrong side of a story. They pick it up at a certain point and want to create the narrative for you and don't give you all the background uh, information that leads up to something. But uh, let me try to move along here. So the kid deserved it, but the teacher was suspended and arrested for child abuse. He posted bail. I think he's getting money online. He's raised about $300,000 for his undoubted legal uh, defense, which he's probably going to need. And uh, I thought, and all the other students like the teacher. They were speaking well with him on the, to the news camera, saying he was, you know, calling the teacher all these words and so forth. And um, but so, verse fourteen and the second half of that verse, that thou 
or rather, um, wouldst thou not be angry with us till thou hadst consumed us, so that there should be no remnant, no escaping? That's God's verdict. Um, don't go back and violate the word of God when he's given clear directions on certain, on certain things. Don't go back and violate and say, I can be friends with all those unsaved people. I can, they're, they're, all of these religious uh, round tables that form in different communities where we're going to have a so-called prayer breakfast uh, every month on all the different religious leaders and pastors. And you get some Baptist preacher and some United Methodist preacher. And uh, over in Pomona, they've got some sort of a local Pomona Valley religious uh, group that meets once a month for some dinner or breakfast. And um, <clears throat> the, the pastor of the former First Baptist Church, now called Purpose Church, he's an active member in that. And uh, the, a couple of Buddhist monks from the Vietnamese temple, they're active members in that. And uh, you name it, they're all there uh, praying together as if we can have harmony with one another. You can't. You can't. Yeah, so, so the idea of separating and being separate from the world, the Bible says, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord God, touch not the unclean thing. And, uh, but that's God's verdict. There can be no affinity with Islam and Roman Catholicism and uh, the cults and everything else. Take your pick. Verses 5 or through 15 are fairly self-explanatory, but modern Christianity can't stomach it. They don't want to hear it, they don't want to be reminded of it, and they don't want to be told what's right and wrong, that certain things are clear and uh, shouldn't be violated, other things are, they can't stand that, they can't handle that. And uh, you and I live in a world filled with wimps and weirdos, and they're just getting worse all the time. 